always causes a problem with that because you get to get into over 500, 800 milliseconds for a return. So if you are old like me, that's the echo and waiting for somebody to say something back to you. Oh, okay. And I mean, I, you know, I'm a, a younger person and, and <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, I work on uh, programs where there's a delay, like Skype. You know, if you're talking to somebody in Asia, sometimes there's a delay and we just accept that. Um, um, and that's, that's, a, that's, again, a really good uh, example. That with Skype, what happens is, is the further you get away, you have different handoffs of where that uh, happens. And anywhere you have a handoff, you have a milliseconds delay that inherently start to build up. Okay. So I want to go back to the infrastructure mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, infrastructure isn't cheap. No. Okay? And it's not like you're going to snap your fingers and all of a sudden, great, we've got infrastructure. So what happens when these camps pull out? I mean, because, I mean, oil's not there forever. I mean, they're going in there to get a product. Yes. They get the product, then what? What happens to all of that investment? Uh, and that is, again, another great question because uh, that's really the space that Rigstar lives in is that infrastructure that's more of a temporary, and a temporary could be five to 10 years as opposed to you know, a life cycle of 20, 25 years. When you, when you look at building those big cell tower infrastructure, those broadband connections, you know, you're looking at at least five, 10 year return on some of those products where uh, we move in with uh, really a mobile solution. And it may only be there uh, for two years, but then we tear that out and, and take it back with us. So when you tear it out, does that mean there's nothing left anymore? That's right. Okay. Very good uh, footprint from a green standpoint. Right? Okay, because I mean, what I'm looking at uh, and what I'm really curious about is, is, I mean, we're putting up all of these infrastructures um, that may or may not be temporary, but yet our population is increasing and people are moving and there's... I mean, do these infrastructure spots offer an opportunity for, you know, people to go in and great, now there's really good internet here and we're in the middle of nowhere. We want to live here or we want to use this. Aww. Is that starting to happen? I mean, is there any awareness that you know of? Well, I, I think that as an Albertan, um, uh, the coverage that we have is ubiquitous. I get to use the word ubiquitous. And so that means like we have an assumption that wherever we go we're connected and and we're actually to the point now where if we're offline and we're not connected we're almost shocked and taken aback that uh, that this has occurred to us um, and that speaks to the great coverage for a very small population when you think of how big alberta is how big saskatchewan is how big bc is and you can walk around with a little device in your pocket and for the most part get access to the internet and even for the most, most part, get access to fast speed internet, which is crazy when you think of, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we we're just hoping to make a call. So is, I mean, the areas that we're talking about, specifically oil sands, Alberta, Saskatchewan, I mean, is this mm -hmm. some of the best internet in the world in terms of, of that kind of capacity? Mm. Well, for a population base that's spread out as we are, certainly. Like, you know, you take a, a company like, or a country like Israel, it's a very small, compact, geographic location with a high density. So the return rate on that is, is there immediately for uh, excellent uh, wireless coverage. But when you spread something out like we have in Alberta, where the, the geographic location between devices is so large, to have that kind of connection, yeah, I'd call it world class. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, we're having a really good conversation about infrastructure, but you're not actually here to talk about communication infrastructure. You're actually involved with the panel to talk about uh, unmanned vehicles, correct? Yeah, unmanned vehicles. It's a really uh, interesting topic and I'm, I'm really excited to listen to our panelists discuss their different ways. Um, you know, really, when you're dealing with an unmanned vehicle, you have to have some type of communication back backhaul. That's got to exist in order for it to do where it's it's making its, its, its uh, assessments of its environment. But that data's got to go somewhere. So now I'm curious, I mean, when I think of an unmanned vehicle, I'm thinking, uh, you know, that little robot that the bomb squad uses so that somebody doesn't have to go in. Sure. There's an unmanned vehicle. Or you see the drone that somebody's piloting from the other side of the world. There's an unmanned vehicle. Um, are there unmanned vehicles that are literally unmanned? Like, it's, it's autonomous. It's actually gone from an unmanned vehicle to now full robot. Can we talk about that? Yeah, you know, uh, um, I would, I'm looking forward to that question being asked at the, uh, at the panel. Yes, I, I, I'm, there's obviously going to be vehicles that have to uh, be able to autonomously um, operate. Um, so they, they're going to have to make uh, sort of what we would consider maybe thinking judgments of where am I, don't crash into that mountain, 
uh, don't those run type. over that person. Yeah, um, and you know we see that in everyday life right now with the, the the Google type vehicles, right, where they're unmanned, and that means you know you're putting in something. There's not uh, some guy back at NASA with a little joystick driving that car for you, right? That vehicle is making all kinds of calculations based on GPS information, where it's located, based on speed, based on vehicles, based based on all of these different things, and it's just. Uh, happening, which is, of course, really exciting. And so this isn't like an isolated thing. I mean, like, it's not like, well, over here, there's somebody working on this. I mean, there are thousands of people working on thousands of different aspects of this around the world. Like, this is this is mainstream already. We just haven't seen it. Uh, you know, uh, they, they anticipate over the next 20 to 25 years that this is going to be a huge growth in the market of unmanned vehicles. And, and there's a couple main reasons that that's going to happen. I mean, the first reason is economics, of course. Um, if we can increase safety, we can increase uh, the vehicles from not hitting in each other because it's taking it out of sort of the human error, then uh, insurance risk goes down and costs go down and so money is saved. Uh, when we look at uh, the oil and gas industry, you know, we have a lot of hazardous environments where, you know, the assessment is, do I want to put a human being at risk or do I want to send in some type of a device that can give me the same information without risking a life? So, uh, I mean, that's a really interesting point. I mean, we were talking earlier about um, unmanned vehicles in terms of a forest fire. Sure. Right? So can you talk about some of the situations in which um, the ideal situation is that a human is not dealing with that situation, <laughs> that it's a non-organic uh, person? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, entity. You, yeah. well, okay. Uh, and I think that's a good fair. Uh, it'll probably evolve, like, you know, when you, you think about it. Um, well, uh, in the case of a forest fire, you know, you might want to get really close to it, but if it was a, if a person and the wind changed, that individual might get trapped behind the fire line. Um, and so in this case, it might be something where you're able to put in a unmanned vehicle to gather that information. Um, in the oil and gas sector, it might be uh, H2S is a killer. Uh, you go into a confined space, um, H2S lays on the bottom, uh, it's heavier than gas, and so most of the deaths that occur with H2S are when somebody goes down, stirs it up, it comes up, it knocks them down, they fall down into the gas and they die. So this is a really good example of being able to use something like that to uh, make sure that that isn't in place. Uh, when we think of pipelines, sorry, yeah. but when we think of pipelines, you know, with these thousands of miles of pipelines that need to be uh, monitored for integrity, uh, for structure strength on the, on the pipeline itself, for leaks, and these vehicles can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and get that information back to us. No overtime. Where, no overtime. <laughs> exactly. I uh, actually I read a really interesting article uh, about unmanned vehicles going to space, and they're actually uh, 3D printers that'll land on an asteroid, grab the materials they need, print parts, and now we have parts for a spacecraft that's already in space. Somebody just has to put them together. I mean, that's a really cool idea. Um, and they were saying the benefits of that is that um, there's no gravity to deal with any of this. And so, I mean, when I think about that and the implications of what that means for our future, I mean, literally the, the future that we've been expecting since the 40s yeah. is here next decade. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite books uh, from the uh, 1970s was uh, Future Shock, where what were we going to do with all our free time with all these machines doing all this work for us? Um, that really hasn't happened. I was planning on playing tennis three times a week, and instead I've got a device with me that allows me to work more and more and more. So, <laughs> so you know, when you think about what is going to happen in the future when you, you the, the scenario that described, of course, that's just one of many scenarios that you start to realize the limitlessness of, of this technology and so, where is it going to go? So we've had some really positive conversations and everything that we're talking about. I want to talk about some of the negative implications. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen Terminator. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a perfect example of unmanned vehicles gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that is a good, <laughs> that is a good example. Um, and I mean, like, like but, you know, where do we... It was doing what it was programmed to do. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, so so how do we prevent that from happening? How do we prevent the worst case futuristic disasters that we like to write stories about and scare children with from actually becoming reality? Because I mean, right now we have drones that have no people in it and they're literally flying around the world nonstop doing things right now based on human operators. Mm -hmm. 
but there's works. Yeah, and there's a lot of trauma associated with that, and that and now we're getting into the moral and ethics. And uh, you know, I was uh, I recall a show where I was watching a, a drone operator, a pilot, who was talking about a mission that he had done in Afghanistan or Iraq, and I was listening to it on the radio, I think. Um, and uh, they had uh, identified their target. They had. Uh, confirmed that that was their target. And there was a 15 second delay in the video between when they launched the missile and the information that they got back. So they launched the, video, the, the missile and they were watching the missile go in and a child ran around from outside of the building to the front. And of course, nobody could stop it. Um, uh, and then when they asked, you know, he was told that was a dog. Uh, but for him, the trauma now of that, that decision was following the chain of order following the command structure that was put in place, but at the end of it is a morale or moral dilemma for him that he now has to live for or with for the rest of his life. And so when you when you put that, yeah, you know, well, to me, I don't know the answers to, to me, those big questions. That's, that's the human safeguard. Mm -hmm. So long as there's a human that stops who stops that uh, that decision process? Who says, "Okay, I'm the one who has to make that decision. You're the operator. You're the whatever, and you make that call. Whether you're making the call you were ordered to make, or you're making the call that you're morally connected with. When we remove that, there is no moral compass anymore. It's algorithms. It's programming. And yeah, mean, to me, and that's a big concern. Well, it is, and and the disaster behind that has already been. Uh, proven out in different uh, scenarios. If we think of the stock market, the stock market started doing all these algorithms and then these decisions were made. Well, one of the biggest uh, companies uh, in New York had an error in the algorithm that all of the other traders recognized and it just about bankrupt the company. They lost something like, uh, you know, I'm just making up numbers now, but it was like three quarters of a billion dollars. Some crazy number in 40 minutes because everybody recognized the people recognized the fault in the algorithm that the trading company was using to make their decisions, and they almost lost their entire net worth over 40 minutes of an error before they could shut it down. Another good example of that is uh, there is a documented case of Russia of, an in of one guy manning um, the nuclear missiles, and he received a warning that America had launched a nuclear war against him. Um, and he was the only person that was there in time to make the decision about whether those were warheads coming over and whether he should retaliate with his launching or whether he should do nothing. Uh, in that case, he obviously chose to do nothing. And is the only reason that we don't have a nuclear war in our history right now is that one individual chose not to do something which turned out to be a reflection of sun flares or something on the atmosphere. Oh. But had he chose that those were nuclear warheads and launched, uh, you and I might not be here. <laughs> so so. We, we've been talking for a bit. I want to go to break. Sure. Um, but uh, no, that was a really good conversation. And I really hope that our audience really starts to think about some of these questions that we're asking because it's your future uh, that's being determined by programming. Yeah. <laughs> Join the conversation next year as more cities become data-driven, become a community partner. Contact us at info at abctech.ca.